In this video, I describe how to perform a high thoracic ESP block for analgesia in major breast surgery with auxiliary involvement. There are other regional anesthesia options, but the reason I personally prefer the ESP block is because firstly, the PEX2 block is not a feasible option where surgical colleagues object to the distortion of their surgical field. Second, I find it more effective than the deep serratus plane block, which is what we used to do in my institution. Third, it's an easier and more reproducible technique for my colleagues and trainees to perform. Patients are also very accepting of the block due to its safety profile and lack of any significant risks. It's essentially an injection into the muscles of their back. And the reason that I perform the block at T2-3 to is because the data shows that blocks at lower thoracic levels such as T5 do not consistently cover the T2A territory and axilla, which is where a lot of the pain arises. This is the equipment and the drugs that I use, which can be modified at your discretion. My choices are based on the fact that I perform this as an analgesic technique and not for surgical anesthesia. I often add dexamethasone to prolong the duration of analgesia and always add epinephrine to reduce systemic uptake and the risk of local anesthetic systemic toxicity. I recommend placing the patient in either a sitting or lateral position. The sitting position is what I recommend as the first line whenever it is feasible as it's the most ergonomic position for probe handling and in-play needle insertion. It's also the most practical if performing bilateral blocks. However, the lateral position is also an option if you can't or don't want to sit the patient up. For example, if you don't have a good method of supporting the patient or you have a patient who's highly anxious and needs a lot of sedation. Whichever position you use, ensure that the scapula is protracted to move it laterally away from the transverse processes and out of the way of the probe. And this is the main reason I personally do not place the patients in a prone position. Depending on the body habitus of the patient, use either a linear or curvilinear probe. The linear probe is suitable if the overlying tissue depth is less than 3 cm, but anything more than that, I find the image becomes muddy and it's hard to clearly visualize fascial layers and the spread beneath them. Adjusting the probe setting to the lower end of the frequency range can improve the image quality and can be attempted. In larger patients, however, with deeper structures, I do recommend the curvilinear probe as it provides a crisper and clearer view of the muscles, fascia and bony structures, and of the fluid spread between them. To ensure we're targeting the right level, we can start with the probe in a parasagittal orientation, 2-3 to three centimeters lateral to the midline and high up on the trapezius muscle, which usually places the probe approximately over the second rib. Slide the probe cranially to identify the uppermost visible rib, which should be the posterior section of the first rib. Then slide medially to visualize the transition to the T1 transverse process. The C7 transverse process will be seen as a slimmer hypoechoic dropout shadow, confirming the identity of the T1 transverse process. Alternatively, we can start with the probe in the supraclavicular fossa to identify the first rib, and then slide and rotate it into a longitudinal parasagittal position over the trapezius muscle to count down to the second third, and even the fourth ribs. From here, slide the probe medially and watch for the transition to transverse processes. Sliding more medially, this changes to a view of the thoracic lamina which have a characteristic flattened appearance. Slide the probe laterally to return to a transverse process view. In this example with a curved probe, we see the second, third, and fourth ribs. Sliding medially, produces the transition to transverse processes. A view of the lamina indicates that we have slid too far. Slide laterally back to the transverse processes and then optimize the view of bone and fascia with small tilting and sliding movements. The curved contour of the tip of the transverse process means that we may have to tilt the probe slightly medial or lateral to get a crisp, clear view of the hyperechoic transverse process tip. And this angulation of the probe is one reason that it can be subsequently tricky to align and visualize an in-play needle. So you should note this angle and compensate for it when you're actually inserting the needle. The needle can be advanced from cranial to caudal or caudal to cranial. 
but I recommend the caudal to cranial approach, especially in the sitting position, as it's the most ergonomic one to use, whether you have the patient either sitting or lateral. Target the erector spinae plane at the T2, T3 intertransverse space. Now, if using the caudal to cranial approach, this means targeting either the cranial edge of T3 or the caudal edge of T2. And this allows us to achieve the most critical part of needle insertion, which is to place the needle tip deep to the fascia of the overlying muscle. Note that one advantage of targeting the caudal edge of the transverse process is that it then provides a bony backstop to prevent us inadvertently advancing too deep, especially when the needle is poorly visible. Here is an example of a T2, T3 ESP block in a slim patient who has relatively tough tissues that require a steeper needle trajectory to pierce. The needle tip is advanced beneath the erector spinae muscle fascia, again using the caudal edge of the T2 transverse process as a backstop. Injection of fluid shows spread under the muscle, lifting it away. In this case, you may also see depressing of the pleura, which is visible. Some muscular distension is not unusual because of fluid backtracking along the needle shaft. This pattern is acceptable as long as there is accompanying intertransfer spread. This is an example using a curved probe in a larger patient. Again, we start by identifying the ribs and the pleura, and then moving medially to obtain a transverse process view in which the pleura is usually less visible. The needle is more difficult to visualize clearly in this instance, but you will note that it can be tracked by sliding micro movements of the probe and tissue motion as the needle advances through the muscles. Aim to place the tip below the deep muscle fascia. Note again how the T2 transverse process acts as a backstop for safety. Perform test injections to ensure that the injectate is spreading under the muscle and most importantly, under its investing fascia. Dynamic scanning can help to confirm this. Once you're satisfied that the needle tip position is in the correct location, instruct your assistant to inject 5 to 10 mil boluses rapidly under pressure to encourage physical spread of the local anesthetic. It's not unusual for patients to experience a mild localized discomfort with the injection, but this is transient and easily managed with simple reassurance. I'll end by reiterating that the correct injection pattern to look for is one that occurs deep to the muscle and its investing fascia. Our most up-to-date understanding of the mechanisms of the ESP block indicates that this is essential if we want to block the anterolateral torso and the territory supplied by the ventral rama of the spinal nerves. The injectate should lift the muscle up rather than distend it, and fluid is often seen spreading both cranially and caudally. It's not unusual to also see spread within the muscle as the fluid tracks back along the needle shaft, but this should not be the only spread pattern. Perform a dynamic scan as your assistant injects to continually assess the spread and confirm that the tip is indeed lying deep to the muscle. It is acceptable to end up imaging a plane through the neck of the rib rather than the tip of the transverse process per se, as you see here because we're primarily interested in somatic sensory block of the ventral rami or intercostal nerves in this clinical setting. Once again, though, the key is to ensure that the needle tip is deep to the overlying erector spinae muscle, as evidenced by spread under the muscle rather than within it. If you have any doubts about this, such as muscular distension, then advance the needle a little deeper. At this point, you may see spread in the intertransverse tissues and in slim patients, the pleura may also be pushed down by the fluid injection, as you see here. Some will point out that this is in fact a hybrid ESP intertransverse plane or MTP injection, and I will not argue with this description. Nomenclature is important, but I think at the end of the day, the most critical thing is to do what works for our patients, 
And if this means entering into the intertransverse tissues, then this is what should be done.